And now, a reading from the Word of God. We're going to be in John chapter 6, if you'd like to turn there in your Bibles at home. We'll be reading from verses 1 through 15. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following them because they saw the signs he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then, and seeing that a large crowd was coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they for so many? Now Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about five thousand in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning again, and thank you guys for joining us for our service. Uh, for those of you that may be new, uh, my name is uh, Johnny, and I'm one of the pastors here at Calvary, and excited to get into uh, John chapter 6 with you all this morning. Before I do, I just wanted to give a few reminders. We have, as was mentioned in the announcements, our um, Ash Wednesday service coming up this Wednesday night, but uh, starting uh, on next week, on the first full week of Lent, we will have our art gallery walk, prayer walkthrough that'll be open. And you can, in the Friday email that goes out, uh, find a link to sign up. And you, by yourself or with family or friends, can and come in for that. So I think that'll be a sweet time. Again, the, the art prayer walkthrough will have a piece of art. It'll also have a prayer uh, attached with it, and we're excited uh, as this is an opportunity for you uh, to focus on this, this season of Lent um, spiritually in your walk with Christ. And so, hope you can join us for that. Um, another thing I was thinking about, just encourage you all if you've had a chance or haven't had a chance to listen to our podcast, we have some great stories up there. We're doing this series called Stories of Calvary, and we're just interviewing uh, people uh, from our Calvary family just about their lives and. Uh, I've, we've heard some really good feedback from people, so thank you guys for listening. And, and if you haven't had a chance yet, just encourage you uh, to check that out. The podcast is called This is Calvary. And uh, so anyways, hope you can enjoy that. And the prayers that we're providing with our uh, prayer art walkthrough during Lent are written again by congregants of the church family. And um, we're hoping to get each of them to record their prayers, and we might put that also on the podcast and kind of be a prayer for us for the week, each week of Lent. So anyways, just a few things for you guys to connect with uh, as our church family. And so anyways, let's get into the text uh, this morning, John chapter 6, uh, as Ryan read it for us. Uh, this miracle, aside from the resurrection of Jesus, uh, is actually the only miracle that is in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so it's a unique miracle, and it's, it's a, I think, a good miracle to start as we're getting into the life of Jesus in our uh, current preaching series. So in our story, as was read first by Ryan, um, we see Jesus taking two fish, 
and five loaves of bread and feeding probably well over 10,000 people. John let us know in verse 10 of chapter 6 that there were about 5,000 men. And so we can safely say that there were uh, probably double that in actual attendance. That is, uh, to state the obvious, impressive. (laughs) Even, as you would say, miraculous. It is outstanding if we can think about the fact that Jesus fed well over 10,000 people with two fish and five loaves. I do my best when reading stories like this to, to slow down and appreciate the wonder of them. For those of us who grew up reading stories like this, reading the miracles of Jesus, it's just so easy to get used to them. And we have categories and titles, the feeding of the 5,000. And it's, I can almost talk about it, I can hear myself even saying it as if it's just so normal, Uh, and and lose the wonder of it. So I, I try my best when I read the miracles of Jesus in particular, to imagine myself experiencing those miracles as if it was actually happening today. If I was lifetime observing something like that happening, and and it just helps me remember how how amazing it is. And I'd actually like to take just a few minutes uh, in this sermon to just think about miracles. What What is the role of miracles of Jesus? Why? Why miracles? Did Jesus really need miracles in order to sufficiently sacrifice his life for our sins? So why are miracles a part of the life of Jesus? And what is being revealed to us in miracles? Miracles, I would like to make the case, are not just random acts of Jesus' superpowers that simply just reveal how strong he is or how powerful he is. I remember, as I reflect back on my youth when I was young, uh, I used to imagine the role of miracles in the stories of Jesus was, was simply just to prove that Jesus is God and God was powerful, he's omnipotent. And so the whole point of the miracles when I was young, I remember thinking that, well, it just had to show that he was God. He was actually the divine. So something like Jesus needed to prove that he was divine and so did miracles in order to provide that evidence. And that was the role of miracles. And so the actual miracles in some ways were irrelevant as long as they were surprising enough to prove Jesus's divinity. It's almost as if the miracles that Jesus did didn't really matter as far as what he did in the miraculous miraculous event as long as it just showed that he was powerful enough to be divine. But I'd like to think of another way of understanding the miracles of Jesus. Jesus' miracles are actually thematically embedded in Israel's past stories and all of their future hopes. Jesus in his person, is revealing through his miracles that he is what the stories of Israel were longing and waiting for. It also reveals that God has not given up on his promises, that he is faithful. The miracles of Jesus actually confirm that God is still committed to fulfill the promises he made to Abraham. That through his family, God is going to bless all the families of the earth. So when Jesus does a miracle, the act of the miracles themselves are intended, so when Jesus does an actual act that is miraculous, it is intended to recall for Israel and for us as the readers, their stories of the past. It's not just a random, miraculous act, but the act in and of itself that Jesus does is supposed to recall for Israel their past stories and for us to think back to Israel's past stories. 
and to promise that God is still active and is going to fulfill his promises for the future. That's kind of the role of the miracles of Jesus. So when we have a promise in Isaiah that says that one day the lame will leap like a deer, and then Jesus causes a man who had not been able to walk for 38 years to now walk, you have contained in that actual miracle promises from past generations, from past stories of Israel, and also the hope of healing for the entire creation in the future. And so again, Jesus healing a man who had not been able to walk for 38 years wasn't random. It wasn't just to show that he was powerful, even though it does show power, to be sure. But the whole point of the miracle was to say the promises made in the stories of the past are finding their fulfillment in Jesus and the full growth of the promises to reach the whole creation are going to happen, are going to be fulfilled. So why, again, miracles? Why does Jesus do miracles as a part of his revelation of who he is? It's to show that God's promise to Abraham to fix the world is sure. The miracles themselves reveal that God's promise to use Abraham's family to fix and restore the creation is sure. This now brings us to our current story of Jesus' feeding the thousands of people with only two fish and five loaves of bread. So the question is, how do we see themes from the past stories of Israel and the future hopes of new creation in this miracle? Let me tell you and remind you of a story first. There was a time all the way back in the book of Exodus that Jesus' ancestors, Israel, were slaves. They were in slavery to the nation of Egypt. God dramatically delivered Israel from their oppressors. There is a long story that goes with that. I'm not going to go to all the details, but God delivers them from their oppressors. In God's leading Israel out of Egypt, away from their oppressors, unto freedom, God splits a massive sea so that Israel could walk through that sea on dry land. We see this in Exodus 14. This is an amazing event for Israel. Moses then sings this song of freedom or the song of deliverance in Exodus chapter 15, praising God for for delivering Israel from bondage. Immediately after this song, within the same chapter in, in Exodus, this song of, that's recorded for us by Moses of, of freedom, of deliverance, Israel comes to a place called Mara. And when they're there, they are without water. And so, obviously, uh, you can't live without water. So God then guides Israel to Elam, um, and that Elam is where there are 12 water springs. And so God provides for them at Elam, even when they were found without water. From Elam, then, they traveled into the wilderness of Sin in chapter 16. It is in this wilderness area, which is in between Sinai and, and Elam, the wilderness of Sin, that Israel is described this as saying this, would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by meat and pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. So they were without food and they were complaining to Moses saying, we would have been better in slavery when we had food in front of us than having to go to Mara and be without water and now having to be in the wilderness without food. But because... God is compassionate. He provides again. He provided for them and took them to a place where there are water springs and they are without water. And then he's going to provide what we read as manna, as food for Israel each day. 
God is going to provide food for them since they are in the middle of a wilderness. And we know that Israel is eventually brought to Mount Sinai, where God renews his covenant with them. All the way back in Genesis 12, when God tells Abraham, through your family, I'm going to bless all the families of the earth. Then they go into slavery. Then God delivers them out of slavery, and he brings them to, uh, eventually to Mount Sinai to say, I'm still committed to your family. That is still through your family that I'm going to fix the world. And God provides for them because he's compassionate all along the way. So there is this story. Now think of that story. Keep that story in mind as I list some themes that we see in John chapter 6. Remember, what I was saying initially about miracles, that miracles, the miracles of Jesus exist to remind us of the past stories and promises of Israel and to get us to look to the future fulfillment of God's promises. So where do we see past stories in John chapter 6? So I talked about this event that Israel went through. They call it the Exodus, as many of us know. Now think about these themes in John chapter 6. What is John trying to make us think of as he's telling the story of Jesus? Verse 3, where is the context? What, where is the scene in which all this is taking place? Jesus went up on the mountain, perhaps to try to think of a scene like Mount Sinai. John also tells us, now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. So John is intentionally letting us know that this whole scene of Passover should come to mind. Passover was the celebration of the Exodus, the deliverance that God provided for Israel. So Passover was a celebration of freedom and deliverance, even in the midst of suffering. So John says, Jesus is going to a mountain. And he tells us, this is all during Passover. And then we have in verse 16 through 20, which is interesting, you have the miracle of Jesus' feeding in 1 through 15. And then if you jump down to 22 and following to the end of the chapter, there's this explanation of why Jesus was feed, did this miracle of feeding. But in between the two in our chapter, we have Jesus walking on water, which is another interesting inclusion of John, thinking potentially of the crossing of the Red Sea. And then Jesus himself refers to, in verses 31 and following, Manna in the wilderness being provided for their ancestors when they were coming out of Egypt. And then there's another interesting detail in verses 5 through 7 when John lets us know that Jesus tested Philip by saying, where should we get the food to feed all these people? And so if you put all of this together on a mountainside, crossing the Red Sea, manna in the wilderness, testing in the wilderness, all during Passover, now all of a sudden this miracle of Jesus feeding thousands of people with five loaves of bread and two fish is not just an isolated miracle to show that Jesus is powerful. Instead, John is creating this whole story that should make us think of the whole story of Passover and the whole story of the Exodus and the wilderness wandering and freedom and deliverance and promise for the future. All of that comes into the scene when Jesus is doing this miracle. John is helping us see that this story of Jesus feeding thousands of people is not just a situation in which Jesus wanted to show he was really powerful or that he could control nature. Both are true. John is helping us see that when Jesus has a crowd on a mountain in which he tests and feeds people and he walks on water all during Passover, that we are supposed to see Jesus as God's answer to bless all the families of the earth. John is helping us see that God's true and final deliverer is Jesus. John is helping us see that Abraham and Moses, and David, and the whole nation of Israel is leading to Jesus, the true and final Redeemer. 
Jesus had a story that had been passed down from generation to generation in mind as he was feeding this crowd. The story that Jesus had in mind is this exodus, this Passover celebration, this manna provision story, this water provision story in which God is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and overflowing in love and faithfulness. This is the God that is being revealed in the miracle of Jesus feeding thousands of people. I also want to highlight some of the conflict in the story. I imagine, when I think of this story, I imagine it almost as it's, as it's, as it's, it's a movie. And you think of a scene where you're getting to the focused scene in a movie, and you can imagine all the noise that's going on around Jesus, thousands and thousands of people around him, following him, hearing the voices, seeing the commotion, all of them talking, imagine this on a movie screen, right? And all of a sudden, the music is going on in the background of the scene, and all of a sudden, it kind of just focuses in on Jesus having this personal conversation with Philip and then Andrew about what they're going to do with this problem. There's a conflict. The conflict is hunger, right? And so imagine the kind of hysteria of thousands of people being all the way out in the wilderness with no access to food and they're extremely hungry. As we know about the crowds that followed Jesus, most likely many of these people in the crowds were poor Many of the people had physical ailments. This was a ragtag group following Jesus, looking for food and life. And so you can imagine the unrest that's probably happening around Jesus. And then all of a sudden, the screen kind of shows, and the camera just focuses specifically on Jesus. And the music fades out. And Jesus is quietly making five loaves and two fish continue to extend. And then we get to verse 11. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. It's just an amazing scene of Jesus providing. The conflict, one, of hunger And yet, that is no problem for Jesus. He provides. Jesus was not overwhelmed by the extent of human need, nor the limited resources to meet the human needs. He provides. We see in the other Gospels, it talks about Jesus looking on to the crowds with compassion. He was motivated by compassion, just as God was motivated by compassion all the way back in the stories of Israel to bring them from Mara to Elam to provide for them 12 springs of water. And when God was motivated by the lack of food in the wilderness for Israel to provide them manna, so Jesus was motivated by compassion to provide this crowd that was following him with food, the food needed. And Jesus says later on, I am the bread of life. Jesus' provision for the hunger was beyond what we could imagine. And so Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And says, anyone who comes to me will no longer hunger or will no longer thirst. If you are hungry, come to Jesus. If you are thirsty, go to Jesus. And you will no longer hunger or thirst. This analogy of Jesus saying that he was the bread of life, I think, can potentially be misunderstood. I don't think this is saying when Jesus says, I am the more important food, I have the more important food to provide for you. I don't think Jesus is trying to say that food, in so much as it is the physical part of life, is not important. And Jesus and forgiveness, in so much as the spiritual part of life, is what's more important. So food doesn't matter. Don't worry about physical food. Only worry about spiritual food. 
I don't think that is actually the contrast and comparison that Jesus is making there, because I don't think he's saying, I actually don't think you need to worry about food. Like, just go the rest of your life and stop eating. Don't eat bread. Bread doesn't matter. Don't eat any other kinds of food. You don't need it. You just need me. I don't actually think that's what he's saying. What he's saying is that in this life, you can be sustained by food, and that will be enough. You can stay alive with food. But when this life ends, there's an opportunity for a next life, another age to come. And for that age to come, this food will not get you there. But Jesus will. And it's as if he is the food that will sustain us into the next life. And that is the comparison that's going on there. It's not that Jesus is saying is the physical doesn't matter. But he's saying, if you want to stay physical all the way into the resurrection of the body, that we need Jesus to get us alive, make us alive again at that day, just like we need food today to keep us alive. Jesus is the bread of life, the bread of eternal life. So you have this conflict in the story that people are without, without physical food, but Jesus also sees both the need for them to have food that will give new life. And so Jesus was motivated by the compassion of both needs, both the physical need that was in front of that him and also the need for new life beyond. And so Jesus tries to tell them, just like manna was sent by God to sustain Israel, so he, Jesus, has been sent by God to sustain us into the new creation. Another conflict in the story that we don't see in John, but we see in the other gospel authors is that they give the context of this as right before the feeding of the thousands of people, the death of John the Baptist. So sometimes we can think of this story of Jesus feeding thousands of people on a mountainside as if it's just stripped from all the other tensions of life or the political tensions in Israel. But that's not the case. Remember, as Jesus has this crowd following him, one of his close friends, John the Baptist, was beheaded for insurrection. Jesus has the threat of looking like he's doing the same thing, of, of insurrection. So there's, there's tension there. There's political tension for Jesus in allowing all of these crowds to continue to follow him and to provide for them and to do miracles and to say things like, I have come from God for you to have life. And further evidence that this is, John sees this, is at the end of our reading this morning, we see that the people were, were sensing this and they wanted to make Jesus king. So this has political conflict written into it also. The fear of being killed for going against the governing authorities. And they wanted Jesus to be king. But they misunderstood the kind of king he was going to be. In kind of closing this out, I want to take this story and, and bring it to our current situation as we're transitioning into Lent. As I've been reading this chapter throughout the week and study, I can't help but think how this informs us to think about Lent and fasting. Oftentimes, fasting is one of the main activities to take up throughout Lent. So I want to make a couple of comments about Lent and fasting as it relates to the story of Jesus feeding the thousands of people. First is that fasting is not an end in and of itself. The point of fasting is not, and the goal of fasting is not to just simply go without food. That is not the end of fasting, is to just simply be able to, at the end of the fast, say, I was able to make it. I went without food for however long the period was, and that was the goal, 
to accomplish. No, it's not an end in and of itself. And it's sometimes hard to not see it as an end in and of itself because it's actually very hard to fast. It's uncomfortable. It can make us moody because we don't have the, ne- the nutrition we need in our bodies. Fasting is actually really hard. And because it takes a lot of discipline at times, it can make us, it can like push us into thinking that that is just the end in and of itself, is to just fast. But that's not the end. So first, fasting is not an end in and of itself. And second, fasting is a way to remind ourselves of our deepest needs. No matter how much bread we eat in this life, it will not give us life after death. I am thankful for bread. I am thankful for food. I love bread. I all love all kinds of bread. We should thank God for the provision of bread and food in general. But no matter how much food or bread we eat, we still have to face the hard reality of death. We can eat and drink ourselves till we are happy and joyful and we can love our food and our drinks in front of us. But no matter how good of a chef can produce, that food cannot address our other longing, and that is to have life after death. Death faces all of us, and bread will do us no good when we think about how to have life after death. And so fasting comes to us as a way to remind us that our deepest needs are something beyond food. We feel the need for food. The point is, as we feel the ache and the longing for food, the hope is that we would see that we have an even greater longing. The point isn't to say that we actually don't need food. Of course we need food. But the point is to help us identify the deepest needs we have as human beings, and that is for eternal life, life after death. So fasting is not an end in and of itself. Fasting, second, is a way to remind ourselves of our deepest longings, even in the midst of the longing for food. And last, fasting involves feasting. Fasting actually involves feasting. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Fast from this life kind of food to feast on next life kind of food. What Jesus is not saying, though, in this is not to say, Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. It's not to say that if you believe in Jesus, that he's the one that God sent. It's not to say that you'll never have hunger again for physical food and drink. That's not what he's saying. He's saying your deepest hunger, your deepest longing will be fulfilled. Your ability to be fulfilled into the next life will be accomplished through Jesus. He is the bread of eternal life. He is the bread of God. And so as we go into this season of Lent this coming week, and we potentially take up some fasting practices, remember that the idea and the hope for fasting is to feast on our longing for Jesus. The Lenten season and fasting provides us an opportunity to long for and love Jesus more than we ever have. If we simply see it as just depriving ourselves of food, then we have missed the point of fasting. 
But fasting allows us to take our longings for physical food and, and, and not fulfill them there to take our longings for food in the next life, but have them fulfilled now and point to their fulfillment in the future. And so as we fast, as you, whether you do it just from one meal or a day or however long you think about fasting during this Lenten season, take the focus from the deprivation of food into the provision of Jesus and the joy that that could, will bring you when you think about life after death, that God will resurrect you from the dead because of your feasting on Jesus. In closing, my, when I read and study about Jesus, it makes me sometimes realize how my passion for following Jesus is, is up and down. Sometimes I just get so stuck on the demands of the day and what needs to be done today or tomorrow or this week. And I find myself just reading scripture and not feeling love for God or feeling passion to know and follow Jesus. But when I read and study about Jesus, and I really allow myself to focus on these stories and really allow them to have the wonder that is contained in them, I'm honestly endlessly fascinated by the person of Jesus. I often have so many thoughts and emotions that run through my head when I read and think about Jesus that I, I can't even articulate them or apply them in life, actually. But they're there as I commune with Jesus over his stories about him. I find that I, at first I lose myself in this person, Jesus. I'm drawn to be spiritually more wrapped up in him than I'm myself when I, when I read about him. And it is so liberating. And really, there is no one else in this world that demands this kind of feeling from me than when I read the stories of Jesus. I think, though, to clarify, I don't just lose myself when I'm drawn into Jesus. But he... he actually helps me rediscover myself, that he, the one he want, created me to be and longs for me to be, empowered by his spirit, I don't just lose myself. I find a new self, a new life. And I hope this for the same for all of us. As we go into this season of Lent, consider fasting from this world kind of food and give yourself space to indulge and feast on the next life kind of food, Jesus. Immerse yourself into his stories. Immerse yourself into his words and his works that you might find forgiveness. Many of you may be listening to this this morning and joining us in our worship service and and you've really never found satisfaction and fulfillment when you think about life after death. And you feel mostly confused. And so all you're really doing in this life right now is trying to indulge yourself in all the this life kind of food to distract you from what you feel a loss of in the next life. And so as we look at the story of the feeding of the 5,000, I ask you to take time today to really assess, am I trusting Jesus for eternal life? Have I gone to him in repentance and brokenness? No matter how much you fill yourself with the this life kind of food, it can never get you to feast in the next life. Jesus sits with 
five loaves of bread and two fish and invites you to feast on him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you that we can read of these amazing, miraculous stories where the whole story of the Bible starts making sense. And we see these amazing connections from stories of ancient Israel finding their climax in Jesus, son of David, son of Abraham, son of Joseph, son of Mary. And so, Father, I pray that for each of us this morning that we would really take time to confess before you our brokenness and our need for you, that there's no needs that we have in this life that can be filled, fulfilled apart from you. And Father, would you, by your spirit, meet everyone in our Calvary family in a unique and special way with your mercy and your love during this Lenten season. And Father, for those outside of our Calvary family listening in, would you maybe for the first time help them to taste and see that you are good. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.